I'm very happy to introduce my friend Jackie Leibowitz, who has her BA in theater from Temple University and is soon to have her MA in theater from Temple University. This goes well. <laughs> <laughs> I know it will. Jackie <laughs> Leibowitz. Welcome everyone, thanks for staying or for just coming. Um, I would also like to introduce my music director, Patrick Tice Carroll. <laughs> Even though he's known about this since last semester, I basically didn't give him anything until last week. So, he's a star. All right, so. All right, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sondheim and Hal Prince and how uh, their careers changed after Merrily We Roll Along. Uh, to start off, I'm going to start with a selection from Merrily. Now you know. Harold Prince, two giant names of musical theater no notoriety that have changed the face of musicals from their art. From West Side Story to Bounce, over 40 years of collaboration have given us their catalog that we all know and love. And, uh, but what's going their separate right way is actually the best worst thing that ever could have happened to them. Uh, today we'll discuss exactly that with the aid of some musical examples. Uh, the song you just heard ends the first act of Merrily, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. First things first, let's talk about the two men at the center of it all, Sondheim and Prince. Stephen Joshua Sondheim was born March 22nd, 1930 to Etta Janet Fox and Herbert Sondheim on the Upper West Side of New York. Uh, he moved to Doylestown, Pennsylvania in 1942 when his parents divorced. Luckily for us, that meant he grew up right next to the Oscar Hammerstein family. Since his mom was a bit of a celebrity hunter, he spent a lot of time with them at their house and Oscar became a surrogate father to him. Since Sondheim wanted to do uh, just what Hammerstein did, he started writing a show when he was in high school, his first musical called By George. In later years, Sondheim would grow up to win eight Tonys, more than any other composer, including one for Lifetime Achievement, eight Grammys, an Olivier, a Pulitzer Prize, and the 2015 Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama. In 2010, in honor of his 80th birthday, a Broadway theater was named after him in his honor, the Stephen Sondheim. Harold Smith Prince was born January 30th, 1928 and adopted by Milton Prince and Blanche Stern. He went to college at the University of Pennsylvania and graduated in three years and then served in two years in the army in Germany post-World War II. When he came back, he started his theater career. He wrote a letter, a cold letter to George Abbott, who we love at Temple, uh, asking for a job and got one as a gopher. Today, that would be a PA or an intern. Uh, he spent six months of unpaid work, unpaid, uh, at, for Ab Abbott as his assistant, and then he started off as an assistant stage manager on a Broadway show. 
At the time, he wanted to be a playwright, but he said he wasn't good at it. So, <laughs> later in life, uh, he would br grow up and break all records and currently holds the most Tony Awards of any person, 21. More than any other person in history by themselves. Now, let's move on to some fun facts. Uh, so Sondheim was the best man at Prince's wedding. As he said, he stood up for him. Um, they met at opening night of South Pacific in 1949, when Sondheim was 19 and Prince was 21, or as Prince remembers it, 8 and 20. Um, Sondheim is actually really proud of the fact that he's a really lazy writer. He uses black wing pencils uh, that are very soft so that he can spend all his time sharpening his pencils instead of writing music. He also likes to uh, write lying down on his couch so that he can easily fall asleep. Uh, he also always has a drink to loosen himself up. There is only one musical he ever wrote sober and he doesn't like it. <laughs> uh, so Prince uh, started his first Broadway show in 1950 as an ASM for Tickets, Please. Uh, he would also go on to stage manage for Call Me Madam and Wonderful Town. Uh, both of these men would go on to win Life Achievement Tony Awards and have entire musical reviews on Broadway about their careers. So, let's start with a quick timeline of their professions leading up to their time at their partnership. So they meet in 1949. Uh, Prince starts stage managing and it's not quite enough for him. So he starts producing in 1954 with The Pajama Game. Meanwhile, Sondheim doesn't get his first break until 1955 with his musical Saturday Night. It was supposed to be his Broadway debut, but one of the producers died in an accident and the show was eventually shelved. Uh, it wouldn't be until 1997 that that musical wound up making its New York debut. In 1957, they did their first show together, West Side Story. Sondheim wrote the lyrics and Prince was a producer. And they were still pretty much both kids at the time. Uh, Sondheim went on to write lyrics for Gypsy in 1959. He had wanted to do lyrics and music, but Ethel Merman said no because she had been burned by a young composer in a flop very recently. And because of that, she didn't want to risk it. He, uh, Sondheim went to Oscar Hammerstein to ask should he do it, and he said yes, you need to learn how to write for a star. So he took the job. Uh, in 1960, they worked together again on Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And Sondheim had a hard year because that was the year Oscar Hammerstein died. Um, in the 60s, they came into their prime to get, pretty much for their own careers. Um, Prince started directing and Sondheim was making new work every couple years. Their next major show they would work on together was Company in 1970. That began the big string of hits. Anyone know these shows? <laughs> Just a couple. Uh, these are the ones people know. Uh, ten years of hits and misses, um, but Sondheim and Prince were now kind of Broadway's dream team. Uh, in the early 1980s, Prince's wife told him he should do a show about kids. And that brings us to Merrily. Uh, based on a Kaufman and Hart play from the 30s, uh, the two, along with George Firth as book writer, decided to try to adapt this uh, play into a contemporary, for the time, musical. Uh, the major thing that happened was that people didn't understand that the story moved backwards. Um, it went from 1980, when they're old and jaded, and moved back to when 1955, when they're still starry-eyed kids. Um, the show would eventually sh uh, shutter after 41 previews and 16 performances. Um, I wanted to sing that earlier song, Now You Know, because Mary is one of the realists in the play, and she's the voice of reason, especially in that song. Um, even the lyrics seem to apply to the whole situation of merrily flopping, and dis it describes picking yourself up, dusting yourself, and starting over. So she's that voice of reason. And that made it my, into my title. Uh, the next song holds a dear place in my heart because Sondheim says it's the only autobiographical song he's ever written. Uh, it's about the struggles of beginning years in the business and trying to find your way after uh, you're still young and trying to get your foot in the door. Um, 
the three friends that are here, um, it refers to him, Hal Prince, Mary Rogers, and all of their composer friends that fit into that character. Um, this video is commissioned as part of the Six by Sondheim documentary for HBO, and James Lapine actually wound up directing this. He directed the whole documentary and this number. Um, and there's a surprise cameo in it that you're going to enjoy. Um, but first, we'll hear a little bit about Sondheim talking to the actors. It's, it's a cautionary tale. It's, it's what can happen to you. Mm. It's how ideals can get. It's a, it's a show about expedience. It's about, you've got to be very careful if you're going to take the expedient path. All they care about is getting their work done and having it heard. It is th three idealists who, whose idealism is one of the things that binds them. The thing about opening doors is it catches the whole zeitgeist, the whole thing of getting excited when you're young writers and you're knocking on producers' doors and you're, you know, er every moment is a crisis and everything requires a phone call and everything is at a, at a level of hysteria and uh, un until you finally get to the producer's office and then it's all a disaster. Stinks. Right. Haven't had the time to do a polish. Will you sing? Right. Who wants to live in New York? Who wants the worry, the noise, the dirt, the heat? Who wants the garbage cans clanging in the streets? Suddenly I do. They're always popping their cork. I'll fix that line. The cops, the cabbies, the sales girls up at sex. You gotta have a real taste for maniacs. Suddenly I do. That's great. That's well. The other stuff as well. It isn't every day I hear a score this strong. But fellas, if I may, there's only one thing wrong. There's not a tune you can hum. There's not a tune you go bum 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 de dum. You need a tune to go bum 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 de dum. Give me some melody. Why can't you throw them a crumb? What's wrong with letting them tap their toes a bit? I'll let you know when Stravinsky has a hit. Give me some melody. Oh, sure, I know. It's not that kind of show. But can't you have a score that's sort of in between? But play a little more, I'll show you what I mean. Who wants to live in New York? I always hated the dirt, the heat, the noise. But ever since I met you, I... Listen, boys, maybe it's me. But that's just not a hum a mum a mum a mum a bolt melody. Write more, work hard, leave your name with the girl. Less avant-garde, leave your name with the girl. Just write a plain old melody. De -de 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 -de. Stopping rehearsals, they ran out of money. We lost it when issue my book was rejected. The nightclub is raided, I have to start coaching. My parents are coming. Just screwed up the laundry. My wallet was stolen. I saw the musician. We're being evicted. I'm having a breakdown. We're we'll all together on Sunday. They're slamming the doors. Singing, go away. It's less of a sail than a climb. The faraway shores, farther. Every day, we're learning to ricochet. We still have a lot to say. You know what we'll do? We'll do a review. What? what? We'll do a review of our own. Who wants to live in New York? Who wants the worry, the noise, the dirt, the heat? Who wants the garbage can play? I can see higher. Thank you. We're looking for someone with a little more experience. Next. They're always popping their cork. Oh, Nobody's ready. Apparently somebody canceled a booking. The songs aren't finished. And what about costumes? How do I learn all these numbers? I'll bring you the copies Nothing of everything they have is finished. Okay, then I'll have to have up. And have we decided or not? I'm not a dancer. Don't worry about it. I'll tell you we're opening doors. Singing, here we are. Filling up days. What a time. The faraway shores. Looking not too far. We're following every star. Shorts, looking here again. The only thing left is when we wish we kept it ten. We haven't got time. 
So, why did Merrily flop? Um, it was a combination of a lot of things. So uh, even though the concept was going back of going backwards in time wasn't new, it was from the original play, uh, the audiences just couldn't follow it for some reason. Um, the show did not have an out-of-town tryout. It opened cold on Broadway, which meant they had to do all of their changes in previews. They had a lot of changes, so that made things really difficult and was a big mistake on their part. Um, the cast of kids wasn't a bad idea, but people had trouble buying them as bitter 40-year-olds in the beginning, and that was hard to recover from uh, throughout the rest of the show. One of the leads in particular, James Weissenbach, who played Frank, uh, wasn't working out and they didn't know exactly why. Uh, they decided to try out another cast member, Jim Walton, in the role for two nights, and something clicked when he did the role. So they made a ch casting change, and they had changed a lead right in the middle of previews. Um, for Prince, he never really had a visual concept for the show, which is something he always has, and he didn't know how he wanted it to look, so that should have been a big red flag for him. Um, one day, he decided to scrap all of the costumes and have all of the characters wear t-shirts with either their name or their character's role on it. Uh, so, for instance, Mary wore a shirt that said, Best Pal. And that made it seem like the kids were playing dress up. People didn't like that. Audiences and critics were leaving left and right. Uh, cast member Agri Pogrebin uh, said she remembered seeing just the backs of people's heads walking up the aisle leaving um, in the middle of the show constantly. Um, it seemed that the critics kind of set them up to fail and they never really had a shot. So that was the end of it. Um, Prince claims that the relationship between him and Sondheim had just run out of steam at this point after 10 years of hits and then such a crushing defeat. Um, and so this is where their dynasty ended, but it's where our story begins. Uh, after Merrily, um, Sondheim wanted to quit the business. Question? They decided to stop together, working together, and went on their own paths. Uh, after Merrily, uh, Sondheim wanted to quit, so, and he was tired of the backlash and ready for something new. Um, it was around this time that Sondheim saw a show at the public that James Lapine directed called Twelve Dreams, and he really liked the visuals that Lapine used in his directing. Um, this, the two of them became friends, and at some point after, uh, they took a trip to the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, and they were inspired by a painting. Their first collaboration was Sunday in the Park with George, a 1984 musical based on the life and paintings of George Seurat and his painting, A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Granja. Um, act one focuses on George, uh, his life, and his connections with his muse, Dot. Act two picks up years and years later with uh, George's grandchild, uh, fictitious, and uh, his career as an artist, because he happens to be one as well. Um, since the painter Surratt is known for his artistic style of pointillism, uh, Sondheim's score reflects that in his songs like Color and Light, um, as George frantically paints. Um, in this number I'm about to show you, everything starts coming together for the painting as he spent all of Act One drawing the different people, um, and it, the result comes together like magic. So this is from the 1984 Tony performance. And now the latest Sondheim musical, Sunday in the Park with George. George is the French impressionist Georges Seurat. And the park just outside of Paris was the stage for his famous painting, A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of the Grand Jacques, which now hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. George has worked on his pointless painting of the various park regulars for two years. And having just sketched his mother, is about to bring order out of chaos and complete his Mandy canvas Patinkin. at last. Mandy Patinkin is George, and Bernadette Peters is his mistress and model. Remember, George. Order. Design. Test. 
attention. Balance. We're doing it at Temple next year. All right. So, there it is. Um, so, the same team reunited for Into the Woods in 1987, a musical based on Brothers Grimm and Charles Perrault's fairy tales. Uh, it weaves different stories together, using a baker and his wife at the center of it all. Uh, it shows that it's not always happily ever after, especially when you get to act two. Uh, the happy-go-lucky characters have their own problems, normal in Act 1, but by Act 2 they become issues. And suddenly, life and death are at stake. Uh, this next song, Moments in the Woods, is sung by the baker's wife after she's wandering through the woods, and she falls for Cinderella's prince. He seduces her, and she takes a step back to realize what she has just done. Thank you. 
they are. So, spoiler alert, then she dies. <laughs> she is stomped on by a giant. She found him. Um, so, uh, is it payback for having just cheated on her husband? Eh. Uh, the complicated storylines like this make it an intellectual uh, masterpiece as well. After Into the Woods, uh, Sondheim and Lapine also collaborated on Passion in 1994. But that's not one of the ones we're talking about today. Um, so, the last Sondheim piece I will talk about today is Assassins. This one had a little bit of a different trajectory. It opened off-Broadway at Playwrights Horizons in 1990, and it didn't get a run on Broadway until 2004. It was supposed to run in 2001, but after 9-11, they figured it wasn't a great idea. Um, so, uh, this show is a little complicated since it straddles the line between reality and fiction. All of the characters are based off of real people who either attempted or successfully assassinated a president. Uh, it was used, they used a killer carnival game as the premise for this review kind of show. Uh, the music spans different eras as it represents each of the characters, since they're all in different times. Um, and it ranges from John Wilkes Booth to John Hinckley. I've personally always found Squeaky From fascinating, because she is willing to do whatever it takes uh, for the men that she loves, specifically Charlie Manson. Uh, she's innocent, yet scary, and I think she's beautifully written by uh, John Weidman. So here is her half of the duet of Unworthy of Your Love. to Prince. So, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, there we are. So he never really pigeonholed himself over the years that he was working with Sondheim, which was great for him because he had constantly been directing. Um, every time uh, Prince opens a show, he has a tradition that the next morning at 10 a.m. he holds a meeting for his next project, something he learned from George Abbott. Um, the biggest and best known Prince musical would undoubtedly be Phantom of the Opera. Uh, an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, their huge spectacle began in London and it transferred to Broadway on January 26, 1988, where it kept going and going and is still going. 
and 30 years later, the Majestic Theater is still filled with the music of Phantom. Prince and Weber chose to adapt this story specifically because they felt that were, there were no real romantic musicals recently, nothing of the romances like South Pacific. Um, so he took the show. In four weeks, Prince blocked it, and nothing has changed since the first preview. It has been exactly the same. Um, here is a video of Norm Lewis, uh, Broadway's first African-American phantom, and Sierra Bagas. Yeah, I wasn't going to sing that example. <laughs> so now to one of my all-time favorites, Parade. Uh, the story of Leo Frank and the murder of 13-year-old Mary Fagan. While a musical about the only Jew in history to ever be lynched on American soil does seem like a tough sell for a musical, artistically it is a masterpiece. It combines the racial tensions in 1913 Georgia with the romance of a big Broadway musical. Uh, with a book by Alfred Urey, who wrote Driving Miss Daisy, and Broadway debut score at the time by Jason Robert Brown, this show ultimately flopped on Broadway after 39 previews and 85 performances at Lincoln Center. But however, it brought a story with a rich history to light, brought Jason Robert Brown to Broadway for the first time, and it left an impact on those who did see it. This is, uh, this is not over yet, and Shout out in advance to Patrick for playing this accompaniment, which is really difficult, and I changed the key on him.
hard. I forgot to change the picture, but this is from the Ardens production with Ben Dibble and Jenny Eisenhower. Philly, woo! All right, so this next show. <laughs> uh, where is it? Okay, so uh, this Last Prince musical I'll talk about is an obscure one, but I felt compelled to include it. Flight of the Lawn Chair Man is a musical loosely based on true events of a man who wanted to fly, and so he attached balloons to his lawn chair and flew. Uh, it was part of a show called Three that contained three one-act musicals. It premiered in Philadelphia at the Prince Theater in 2000, and other musicals that were in it were The Mice, which was directed by Browd Rouse, who was Prince's assistant from 1995 on and Lavender Girl, directed by Scott Schwartz, Stephen Schwartz's son. Prince oversaw the whole show, but directed Lawn Chair Man specifically. Uh, this show seems pretty silly on the surface, but it, has, it speaks to the heart, and it speaks to the desire that we all, des we want something, and why should we let it keep us down when we can fly? So this is the first song I ever heard from the show. It ends act one. It's called I Want to Fly. In 2002, Lonnie Price, the original Charlie in Merrily, was asked if he could get the original cast back of Merrily for a reunion concert. It was a fundraiser. The cast said yes. Susan Stroman volunteered to direct and do some limited staging. And naturally, they invited Sondheim and Prince so that they could just come and enjoy it. Both were hesitant to go after some of the bad air that happened following the show. But they showed up anyway because they should and they could not believe the response. In the years that had passed, Merrily had gone from abandoned and droved to adored. Now, when the cast came on stage for Bows, they described it as feeling like rock stars. 
this ignited their passion for working together again. And that led to Sondheim and Prince doing Bounce. Uh, Bounce is a musical about the Meisner brothers during the gold rush. Uh, over the years, it went through multiple names, including Wise Guys, Gold, with an exclamation mark, Bounce, and ultimately became Roadshow. Another partnership with John Weidman, uh, this brought back the Dream Team. Uh, they had productions at the Goodman in Chicago and the Kennedy Center in uh, Washington, D.C. And both productions got either lukewarm or negative reviews. It wasn't received well. So it was shelled for a few years. And by the time it came back around in 2006, 2008, Prince was no longer attached. Um, it was retitled Roadshow. Uh, there we go. So what's next? Um, Sondheim is currently working on a new musical with David Ives, uh, based on two uh, Louis Buñuel films, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie and The Exterminating Angel. A workshop of the first act of this new musical was presented at the public in early 2017. It was slated for a production later last year, but they still didn't finish it. But honestly, they have time. It's fine. Uh, Prince is working on two new musicals. Yeah, Mary. It's based on two? It's based on two. That each one is going to be an act. Even though they're not actually connected, they're connecting them. Oh, okay. Yeah. The first one is about a bunch of people going to dinner and what goes crazy, and then they kind of moved act two, made them the same characters, and combined. Okay. Uh, so, Prince is working on two new musicals. Um, one is based on the famous affair between financier Diamond Jim Brady and Lillian Russell. Uh, the other is based on a documentary called How to Dance in Ohio. Um, these are still pretty new. They just announced this in January that he'd be working on them since he was working on Prince of Broadway until last fall. It's still actually considered this season. Um, and he released a book, so there's not a whole lot of information about Prince's new musicals yet but he's 90 and Sondheim is 88 and they're both still working on new projects. How many of us can say that? So, um, to end, I want to say thank you to both Sondheim and Prince for both never giving up for this lifetime of work and then some and continuing to give us more art, um, for keeping the artistry in a commercial industry where it's so easy to get wrapped up by money and making sure what they wanted was artistically sound. Um, and also for staying friends, even though they realized they couldn't work together anymore because it wasn't working out for them, they stayed friends. They still talk to each other. It's adorable to watch them. So, um, and I love seeing the comparison over the years. Um, so to end, I'm uh, gonna bring out one more song from Merrily, and that would be Our Time. Thank you. 
And thank you again, Patrick.